Deuteronomy chapter 6, I want us to look at this passage of scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 all the way to verse 9. And the Bible says this in verse 7, you shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. I want you to pay attention to that verse. You shall teach your children diligently. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, walk by the way and lie down and when you rise. Then verse 20 goes on to say this, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? In other words, the Lord expects there will be a time when your children will ask you a question and that question will be, why do we do what we do? Why do we get up on a Sunday morning? Why do we go to church? Why do we dress up and come here on this afternoon? Why do we do all this? Young children will ask, and the Lord says, this is how you would model a life for them. So what we wanna do is, in today and in the coming um, Sunday, the next Sunday, the following Sunday when we have an on-site service, we want to take some time to share some practical principles of how to lead at home, whether it is in your marriage or whether it's at family with, with your children. We want to take this time to do this, and I pray that you will come here just to eagerly to learn. Take, down the, take photos of slides that will come up, or write down the points that the Lord is saying to you, and write down some of the questions we're going to ask ourselves, and maybe process it together as a family. Would that be all right? Now, in the afternoon services like this, at least between now and, and uh, April, I want to not do expository preaching. You will get that on the, on the other weeks when we talk about Revelation. But on this topical study, we want to just explore something. And when I'm looking at what model can we follow, there is a couple that come, came to our mind. Many years ago, the Lord um, laid them in my heart and I wanted to be mentored by them and uh, I had the awesome privilege of uh, meeting them and, and then welcoming them to our state, our city and uh, we hosted a seminar with them and this couple is from Manila. Their name is Pastor Peter and Diona Tanchi and they have developed a beautiful framework when it comes to marriage and family and I want to take this time, not only today but in the next time we're going to study I want to give four principles today and then another four in the weeks to come. It will be on the screen. It's, it's titled Motivate. Say that with me. Hey, come on, you can speak. Motivate. Now, Motivate stands like this. M stands for modeling. O for open communication. T is for time. I is for intimacy. V is for vision. A is for affirmation, and T is for training and teaching, and E is for entrusting our children to God. I'm going to ask Pastor Isa to lead us in the first one, model. So we wanted to start off with the first um, letter of the acronym MODEL, and uh, this is one of the most important, that's why we're starting off with it. So the first M of MOTIVATE is really on the principle of modelling. And uh, it's really understanding that children actually copy us, whether the good, the bad, or the ugly. So we actually have to understand that when we model, we actually model either by design or by default. First, we have to understand that we are given the blessed gift of children. So if you're parents and you've been given the children, understand that it's a blessed gift of stewardship that we've been given. And God expects us to actually parent our children spiritually we are to embrace the stewardship of our children. Now, when we come face to face with the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, the question will not be about how well have you taught your children ballet lessons or basketball lessons or music lessons or even how to uh, manage money or how to make money. The question will probably be something like, did you model a life of loving God wholeheartedly by loving his word, doing his will? And did you train up your children to do the same? Deuteronomy chapter four, verse nine says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. 
Proverbs 22, verse 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So there's some key verses throughout Scripture. The Lord actually continually encourages us to steward our children, to train them, to be a good model for them. So we can either model by design or by default. So the first principle sharing is that our children copy us, whether the good, the bad, or the ugly. So parenting is about mentoring, mentoring them through modeling. And as they say, example explains everything. So we usually think it's not, don't do what I do, do what I say. But kids end up doing what we do more than what we say. Isn't that right? So our children may do what they are told to do in our presence, but they usually do what they saw us do in our absence. And many parents tell their children, do what I say, not what I do. But research actually tells us that children have an inborn ability to actually mimic and copy. They copy what they see. And you all know that from newborn babies. You know, you teach them things, they mimic and they copy. So they imitate not only our actions, but also our behaviours and attitudes. So if we want to teach your children the right way to speak and behave, we actually need to model it. Now, you often hear stories about little kids, you know, about age three or four. They're used to being in the car with their dad or their mum, who maybe be an impatient driver, and they get into road rage. And then the parent gets angry at the driver, and they use four-letter words, such as move, turn. Okay, no, you're all expecting a different four-letter word, isn't it? Need to be more sanctified. But anyway, just kidding. So they use four-letter words such as move and turn. And next time the three-year-old's in the car with their mom or their dad and, the, and a driver pushes in, that same three-year-old uses the same four-letter words and it shocks the parent when it comes out. But where does that come from? They mimic, they model, they copy. So it is all about modeling. So we need to actually model good character. And we need to understand that the depth and quality of our character actually determines the depth and quality of our parenting and our modeling. So to be a parent is actually to be a disciple maker. And that means that we have to make the effort continually to keep changing and growing ourselves in Christ. Parenting, parenthood is an ongoing journey. We never stop learning, we never stop growing. So modeling is the most effective way of teaching. The Bible actually instructs us in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5 to 9. So you can note down the Bible verses and I'll read it out for you. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and, they'll be, and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and, they, and on your gates." Another beautiful verse, and, and we have to echo the words of Apostle Paul. He was so confident when he said this. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. He was so confident of his own walk with the Lord. He said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. Also, Philippians 3 verse 17. Join one another in following my example, brothers, and carefully observe those who walk according to the pattern we set for you. Again, he declares, join in following my example. So as parents, as husbands, as, as wives, are we confident as leaders in the house, even if you're a young adult leader, a young worker leader, are we confident of the example we are setting for our children or the young people that are following our footsteps? So we need to understand also this principle, that values are more caught than taught. You've all heard that saying. So values are more caught than taught. And effective parents model loving God with all their hearts, knowing and obeying God's word, and then they teach God's word diligently to their children as a way of life. So we cannot teach effectively what we do not practice, and we cannot give what we do not have. So we can't teach effectively what we don't practice, we can't give what we don't have. So we must set the example first. So if you want your children to have regular quiet times or a strong prayer life, you firstly need to have it. It is something that we need to model for our children so that they catch it. So in our household, when we teach things about finances, in the area of finances, we teach our children financial stewardship to our boys right from young. We teach them about tithing, to honour the Lord with their substance and then give even the extra to missions. And that's something that we've taught them from young. We model it, we give extra to missions and we support and sponsor children in compassion. We give to Fresh Hope, we give to um, different um, Indian pastors, Indian village pastors in India, and it's our children see and, and catch this. So right from young, they started to tithe out 
their very first job being basketball referees at the Hill Stadium, they honoured the Lord with their substance, their first fruits of their offering. And so it's something that we want to teach uh, to honour the Lord. So financial stewardship is something. Hallelujah. One of the things that I want you to catch is the principle, modelling. Discipleship is relational. And again, even in discipleship, whether you're a life group leader or a pastor or a member in the church and you're trying to disciple your family, you don't disciple through rules and regulations. You disciple through relationship. And that is why modeling plays a key role. This is a concept that Jesus himself practiced. He brought 12 people towards him, with him, and he journeyed with them night and day. And that through modeling, he left an indelible mark on their lives. They were transformed from the inside out. Now, one of the things, the funny thing that happens in our family is my wife is a thrifty queen. She looks for uh, discount and, and look for bargains, and that's where she will go and buy. Now, if you're a woman today, take a guess how much this dress would have cost her. We're getting real. We're getting real here. We're getting, We're getting really, really. <laughs> you know, she. It may look a lot. How much is Annie? Ah, she wouldn't want to say it to me. But the reality is, you know, the 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 there was a, there was a there was a one day that we they asked for us to do a photo shoot for the cover next year, next week's uh, um, service. We're doing a cover shoot. You would have seen this photo where. We look like, like that, huh? <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Now, that, that look, it was only 10 bucks, the dress. No, that one was 25. That one was 25. The other one wearing Netflix. How much is this then? This is $20. Okay, we settled it just for today. Just wear this. <laughs> now, her dress sense is beautiful, but her, she will look for bargain. I've never seen her pay anything uh, outrageous. The outrageous thing will be $30. That's outrageous already. So, and so the same thing, my children pick up. Now my, my, both my boys are in a stage where they, can, they, they, they want to spend. But the thing that they do is, Dad, you can't just go to one shop and buy. You gotta look for bargain. You gotta search around. You gotta drive to that suburb and buy in that shop because there it's cheaper. That is uh, modeling. Is that right, honey? <laughs> They have they caught, caught it. The bargaining you can't the sit and talk to a young person about these things, but they have caught it. <laughs> so, anyway, so different things children catch. Yes, yeah, so, anyway, what you mixed up was, yeah, that, that's, now, now you know my secret. I love shopping even at secondhand shops. So I think, well, if our mentor, Pastor Edmund, can do it, so can I. So, <laughs> so anyway, so children actually catch some of these things, which you might not say out loud, out loud but it's because of the behavior and the attitudes and I guess the, the values um, that parents have in their household. And each of you have different cultures, each of you have different convictions, and your children will actually start to catch it. Now, another way, uh, another point to make is also beware of hypocrisy. Even when we're modeling, beware of hypocrisy in our lives. And what, what do I mean by that? So have you heard the saying, your actions speak so loudly that I cannot hear what you are saying? So sometimes our children actually see our actions and they speak even louder than words. So we must be really vigilant to actually walk our talk, especially at home. And if you don't walk your talk, don't talk. Okay? So that is, that is the saying goes. So it's a wrong style of parenting to say, do what I say and not what I do. A correct style of parenting is actually to say, do what I say and do, so be consistent. So we must be aware of hypocrisy because when hypocrisy happens in the home, the danger is that spiritual apathy can actually happen in your children when they see two different things happening between what their parents say or with the face that they put in front and then the behavior that's happening at home. And children can actually get turned off or, or have become spiritually apathetic because they don't see a consistency. And so that is what we call practicing the one-man principle. And what do we mean by the one-man principle? One-man principle means who you are outside your home should be consistent with who you are inside your home. So let me expound that a little bit more and share some testimonies on that. So you all see, you know, Pastor Paul preaching here on stage, you know, week after week, and now you see him on screen. Believe me, he's the same at home. 
uh, somebody actually asked me when they first came to the church, they really wanted to know um, if he was the same at home and what you see on the screen. And he said, is, this, is he the real deal? And I said, yes, he is the real deal. And he said, that's good because coming from the wife, they take that. And what I mean by that is, not only does he preach on stage, he's constantly preaching at home to us. You can ask my boys, constantly talking, teaching all the time. You know, I was kind of happy when um, COVID started because I thought, oh, all that 20,000 words are getting used up each day and he's preaching and he's using that up and I can get a bit of a break, but it's constant. So he's a preacher at home, he's a preacher at home, and in fact, I think he speaks more than me. So women are meant to speak actually 20,000 words a day, men 10,000, but I think in our home, it's the other way around. Wouldn't you, would you agree, church? Back me up here, yes. So often, and, and um, so he's constantly praying and, and preaching. And even at home, what we encourage is parents um, do consider, even in this COVID season, when there's no church on site, what are you doing with church online? How are you treating church online? So I'm getting pretty real here, I know, and uh, it might be pretty convicting. But your children are actually watching how you treat even church online. Do you actually be encouraged, set aside that time on Sundays to still gather together as a family or with your friends if you're inviting other families together to watch church online, have church at home together with a few other families or at least with your own family. Don't think that, oh, I can get to it later and, you know, the service is left online so I'll watch the sermon later because often you won't. You'll squeeze it in and you won't. So the behaviour and attitude of how you treat church, even on the Sundays when it's church online, your children are watching. And most importantly, God is actually watching. So how we uh, treat these things, how we honour the Sabbath, how we treat the Lord, how we treat the Word of God, these are important and these are the values that your children will catch whether you know it or not. What you sow is what you'll reap uh, further on. So modelling also, another point, just briefly, is about authenticity and not perfection. So modelling does not mean that we must be perfect. Modelling is about being authentic and real with our children. So none of us are perfect. And the reality is we all do make mistakes, including parents. But we need to model humility by apologising and asking to be forgiven and asking for forgiveness when we make mistakes. And this is something my husband is actually very good at because he makes so many mistakes. Had to throw that one in there. Yeah. I do. I'm sorry, honey. I'm modelling apologies. I do, actually. I make mistakes all the time. And one thing that I do is because um, I guess growing up in India and having a different value system that I grew up with and raising Chindians at home, it's very different. Um, Of course, I did not want, I I had to consciously make that decision that I do not want my children to have an identity crisis because a lot of times when you're growing in a culture which is your parents are from another culture and you're growing in a Western culture, it, it has its own, um, what do you call it? It has its own, it leaves a, a kind of a, a impact on their identity. So one of the th- core things we, we want to do is to be able to pro- protect them and to keep promoting just the word of God culture. And so sometimes I, there are things I want to say, I don't want to say, but I do end up saying it sometimes. And that is where I hurt them. And when I do hurt them, then the obvious thing to do is to be able to go and ask for forgiveness. And I've done that many times. As a parent, I have walked into my son's room and said, you know, I've, I've, uh, dad should not have said that or dad did not mean that. I just, uh, maybe something else was going on in my mind, but I confess those things and say, would you please forgive me? And uh, my sons have been gracious enough, both of them, um, and... Uh, and I break down and I cry and I say, this is something that I shouldn't have done. Please, would you please forgive me? And, and I, I know that at that, that moment, God gives grace for us to reconcile as a family and to really continue to build that authenticity. Now, this is what is important. Modeling is about that unconditional love, but it's also that submission, that spirit of submission that comes where the father himself leads by example, by humbling himself. So... Even, even with our arguments, I've, I've always said to you, we don't fight as husband and wife. We always have intense fellowship. And sometimes those intense fellowship can happen in front of the children. And when it happens in front of the children, it's, uh, uh, I usually pray, Lord, secretly, Lord, bring wisdom to her. Let us see the wisdom in what I'm saying. But it doesn't work. So we always come back to that place to say, um, 
I shouldn't, and I apologize, and, and, and take, take, that, take, that, uh, take control of that situation by bringing that humility, bringing that submissive spirit, and working together as a family. This is where we need to set an example for our children, and this is what we do. Mm. Yes, so even in the husband and wife role, we need to set example because the Bible actually very clearly outlines the role of husband and wife. And so we need to model them to our children from young. So one of the um, um, Bible has a lot of instructions for life and even the roles that we are to play. So even it tells, the Bible even tells us who's responsible for making coffee because it says he brews. Right? No, I know that's an odd joke. But I, I wish the Bible had, you know, said, I wish there was a book of the Bible called He Washes, He Irons, He Cooks. That, that would be so wonderful. But anyway, there's only, only the roles of the husband. Let me quickly outline them because it's the most important thing for parents to model to their children um, their God-given role. So your understanding of these roles yourself is foundational to effective parenting. So the husband's role, which is to lead and to love unconditionally. So I'll just give the key references. Ephesians 5.23, husband is to lead. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself is its saviour. Ephesians 5.25, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 6.4, fathers do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And likewise, the wife... We need to also learn our role and model that for our children. Ephesians, uh, Galatians, Genesis 2.18, we are to play the role of the helper. Then the Lord said, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And Ephesians 5.22 to 24, about submission. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And so this is something that I also want to model my children, uh, to my children, um, the role of a wife, so that they know what to look for when they're praying and looking for their future life partner. And I believe that um, in our household, Paul has shown great spiritual leadership by um, setting the example, obviously being a strong leader, but every morning without fail, whenever the boys go, even, even, even though they're much older now, whenever the boys go to school or leave the house to go drive off to uni or catch a train or something, he always prays for them, pronounces a blessing upon them, prays for their walk, prays for their protection, prays for them to grow in the fear of the Lord, etc., etc. So the boys really see him modeling that spiritual leadership and that, and that um, honoring the prayer of, um, and, and really honoring the blessing and the prayer of the Father. So that I pray that my own boys will catch that when they have their own children and follow likewise. And I believe our boys are so blessed because of the prayers of the spiritual leader in our home. So that's wonderful. And finally, I just want to just share also, we need to also be model, um, model how it is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit's power. So as we mentioned, we don't want to be to a place where we lose our temper constantly to our children or to our spouse. Because when we lose our temper, we can lose our testimony. And so here's a short acronym, if, it, if they've got it there, PRAY, P-R-A-Y. Uh, you can take it down. Um, it's a, it's a, just a four, quick, uh, four quick points which will help you in that point when you're feeling, you know, the emotions boil over and you want to take control, uh, you want to uh, pause. And, so P stands for pause and take a breath. R is resist your first impulse of what to do as it is usually reactive and hurtful. A, ask the Holy Spirit, what should I do or how should I respond and why? yield to the Holy Spirit, and then respond. So I hope you find these um, little acronyms helpful, and um, remember these at the, when the time comes, that we need to pause and not react, but respond. I think it is a moment to be able to ask the Lord's help, because when you're in the, when you're in the situation and your emotions are getting ch charged up, one of the ways we need to take that moment is to pause not say the first thing that comes through our lips, but rather reflect upon what you're going to say and ask the Holy Spirit's help and then yield to the prompting of the Spirit. And I think that is where we can overcome the carnal desires to have control, carnal desires to have our egos being stroked, but rather allow the Holy Spirit to rule and reign in our marriage and in our parenting. The second thing I want to talk to you about is open communication. Now, this is the principle I want you to take down. Open communication opens your child's heart. Now, open communication will also open your spouse's heart. What do we mean by open communication? 
James chapter 1 and verse 19 says this, everyone be quick to hear, slow to anger, and slow to speak. Now, one of the core things that you and I need to pay attention to is God created us this way. He gave us two ears and only one mouth. The more we speak, the Bible says there will be error, there will be sin. We need to learn to listen more than we need to speak. And one of the things that, as my wife said already, that I speak a lot, but at the same time, I have to help myself to actually pause and hold back and to hear what my child is saying or what my spouse is saying because we need to learn to develop that art of listening. And one of the things about listening is that we got to listen to not just the verbal cues but also the nonverbal cues. See, many times as a child grows up in a, in a household where Anytime the child says something that seems to be opposing to what the parents hold as a view or a value, and the parents react immediately and straight away start to lecture, what happens is the child will clam up. And you, you train your child in that kind of a behavior pattern. In other words, you, you say, they say something and they're just becoming vulnerable to open up their heart to be able to say something. But the moment you jump and to stop it and arrest it and, and correct it and, and react to it, immediately they will clam up. And the more they, will, they, they clam up, what will happen is they will look for other sources where they can open up their heart. Now, the most important thing in a marriage is that your wife opens her heart and shares with you deeply what she's really feeling, what is really going on in her inner life, what are the thought patterns that are there. The same thing for a man, to be able to openly share with his spouse what is going on in his deep heart, in his thought patterns. Now, this is important. The reason why we, we, we need to have this open communication is that, that where, where we don't communicate, we are created as beings that need to communicate, and if we don't find it at home, we will find it elsewhere. We find it elsewhere. That is where uh, many times marriages go through that phase where they are not having an affair, but an emotional affair, where they're dependent, the spouse is dependent on someone else to be able to give them a listening ear. Now, this is important for us. Our child, the same thing. If we don't take time to have that open communication, they will go to their peers to listen to, and they become the voice that they will follow. One of the core things that we find here is that we not only listen to the words that they say, even listen to what they are not saying. In fact, as a communicator, one of the things we learn is um, words only matter 7% of the time. I want you to listen to this. This is an interesting stats. Words in any communication only matter 7%. The rest is tonality. Tonality is about 37%. I don't know how they calculate it, but it's 37%. And the rest is physiology. In other words, body language, facial expressions, tone, the, 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 the way that your, the, the, your face shows, the frown, everything matters. So when a child or a spouse is wanting to open their life and share their deepest, darkest things that they're going through, just a little frown in your, in your face, just a change in your uh, expression can already tell them that you are not interested or you are not accepting or you are judging, you're becoming critical. Now these things matter. That's why as a parent, whether you're a parent of a teenager or a young child, or you have been in marriage that you want to have a healthy respect and relationship, one of the things that matters is that you develop sensory acuity, that you learn to not only read for the clues that are happening through verbal communication, but also through the non-verbal communication, because it matters. And, and, and the more you, you take that into consideration, you can hold back. One of the things that I, um, as I was in a, in, a, in a household that will happen quite often is one of my sons will say, Dad, you're angry. I say, I'm, I'm not angry. But Dad, no, no, Dad, why is Dad angry? He will ask Mom, why is Dad angry? This is not, not a big deal. Why is he angry? I say, no, no, I'm not angry. The more I keep saying I'm not angry, they, they think that I'm angry. 
It's because as a communicator, one of the things that I do is, from a young, from 16 years old, I've been a communicator. And as a communicator, there are three ways you can control your tone. There is a question tonality. And most of, your, most of the Aussie friends, when they speak, they always finish with the, it, the imitation will be always on the high end. It will always go up. It's almost like a question mode. And that's a question tonality. There are other ones who will be just a statement tonality. But then there is a command tonality. If you watch a newsreader, it's always a command tonality. In other words, it will come back and it'll, everything will drop. Everything will drop. In other words, there's a, when you speak, it's as though you're speaking with power and authority. That's the key. Now, you don't do that to a child. <laughs> but the same thing, because that's what, how we communicate, and that's why sometimes I start, end up communicating to my family like that. And so my son picks it up as, that's not normal. You're angry. I said, no, no, I'm not angry. Then, so I had to take that before the Lord and say, Lord, I, I realize that I'm coming across as someone who is not accepting what they say. Here, I have to hold back. So this is something we need to be aware of, isn't it? Now, many times I tell my wife, you know, she looks so lovely, isn't it? I always tell her, please don't talk to me like that. I'm not your child. I'm your husband. I'm not a, I'm not a child in, in the school where you're the principal. In other words, just like she's talking to the kids, sometimes she can turn to the husband and talk the same way. We have to catch ourselves. We have to catch ourselves to be able to say, no, 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 that's not how we model. We need to model that, that place where we can come and be able to say, no, that's not how we speak to one another, and we want that healthy respect, healthy atmosphere at home, and we gotta build that open communication. One of the things where we really want to grow as a family is to be able to share our feelings deeply. And, uh, and as, uh, as many of you know, pastors carry a lot of emotions because on a week-to-week -week basis, we, our emotions can range from having a new baby to someone um, passing away. Or from a week-to-week from a -week basis, it could be any challenge in someone's marriage or someone's parenting, something that is going on in the church life. Now, these emotions do cost us quite a bit. So when, when, when it comes before, we got to go and process this before the Lord. And sometimes our children also will notice that we are not available emotionally because our emotions are already consumed with other things. So one of the things that we learned to do is to be able to bring our children into the journey with us because we want them to serve the Lord together. Now, this is important for you to understand because many times um, you will hear this, that pastors' children don't want to be in ministry. How many of you have ever seen PK kids? They call them PK. PK kids don't want to be in ministry because they've seen how ministry has wounded their family, how the ministry has cost their parents' marriage, how the ministry has taken their family away uh, from them, from being available to them. So one of the things that you and I need to, and we, we take very seriously in our household is that we don't want to do that with our children. We want them to journey together with us. And we want them to know these are how we serve God. And even through that process, we are dependent upon God and we need his help. We are vulnerable to all sorts of emotions and we need help and we need each other and we need them to journey together with us. And by the grace of God, by having that open communication where we can talk deeply about what we are going through, it helps them to understand, bring them on that journey to, be, to, to partner with us and, and have that partnership to say, yeah, we serve Christ together. Daddy and mommy need help. They need to be prayed for. They're, they're, they're not just people who are ministering to others, but they, are, they, are, they need ministry as well. And we are here as a family to minister together. This is important for us. And one of the things that I want you to catch from here is this. When you're listening, you're not just listening to, you're not just listening to the words, but I want you to pay attention to listen to their heart. Now, this applies not only to your children, but also to your spouse. Not only to the spouse, but also to any relationship you have in life. It is not just listening to the words that they are saying, but learning to discern what is in their heart that is coming out. Now, I'm not sure if you, um, in, in one of the sermons, we, we talked about the three C's of coaching. I think it was this morning's sermon. Three C's of coaching. We always talk about um, conduct. 
when we, when we look at someone's behavior, we look at the behavior and we say, that behavior ought to be changed. That is not something I like. But I want you to not be per someone who just corrects the behavior. That is something we work very hard on. We don't want to correct the behavior because behavior correction is just a superficial modification. But what we are interested in is heart transformation. And how do we transform the heart? is to be able to recognize that behind that behavior, there is a character that is being formed. We need to learn to discern that character. And be, behind that character, there is a condition of heart. Because sometimes, good people will act out of character. So if you just go by the conduct of a person, you can even wrongly conclude about a person and say, that's the kind of person that person is. No, no, that was just a slip on that day. So one of the things is we have to discern what is the condition of heart? Why is this happening? And when you discern the condition of heart, you can come and minister to that person. So this is why, as people of God, we are called to continually model that. That's why we said in the earlier pause, reflect, ask the Holy Spirit, and to say, Lord, what is going on in this, in, this, in this situation? What is going on in the heart? How can we minister and we bring about that change and, and allow the Lord to do the work? So listen not only to their words, but listen to their heart. But finally, I want you to listen to God because the Lord has a deep work that he wants to do in your family, and that could be the moment where he does that. So in, in closing, let me give you five things to write down about listening. One, it is about availability. I want to, we want to make sure that people in our family, whether it's our spouse, whether it's our children, or whether it's m m people that we're looking after as members, one of the things is availability. Are we available for them? Available for them to be able to, uh, available for them to be able to talk to us and, and share that deeply. That's one. Secondly, attention. When the kids are talking to you, when your spouse is talking to you, pay full attention. Not only that, be present. We all can do this. We can all automate our listening. That means we're not actually listening. We're already dreaming about something else. But when we need to be present, and that is where we train ourselves to listen intently, and to really discern what is going on. So when you're fully present and give that attention, then the third thing you need to adjust is the attitude. Because a lot of times we show emotional response. We show a response through our uh, frowning or through our, uh, we are already expressing our judgment. We are becoming critical. One of the things is to be able to stay neutral and to have that attitude that says, I want to minister. I'm here available for you and I want to, make sure that we can journey together. Number four is to be able to ask questions, asking open-ended questions. It's not just a question that will cause them to say yes or no, but it's a question that will invite them to open and share their life with us. What, why do you feel that way? Or why is it that you said that particular thing? What is going on? So it is more inviting that, that time to be able to talk about things. Finally, it is also that all topics, when you really want to build a culture of authenticity, a culture where you're open in your communication, no topic is too much. In other words, no topic is off limits. You should be able to come and talk about the deep things. So one of the things we do in, in our family time when we do our dinners together is to be able to openly share about some of the things that we are going through as a family, openly share about what we are dealing with in a ministry environment, and, and allow our kids to journey together and help them to see and also discern our own heart where we are. And, and the same thing, when we open up and do that same thing, they will open and share. Praise God. Now, let me give you a couple of uh, application questions. Just take this down it's, it, if it comes up in your screen. What hinders your child or your spouse from opening up to you? What topics would you like to discuss? How will you encourage your child to share their heart with you freely? I think this is something for us to really take to heart. There is no such thing as a generation gap. It is only a communication gap. And for us to truly come to that place where we can build an environment where there is an open communication.
Let me do this. Yeah. I'll do this in brief then. So we've got um, T stands for time. So it's a principle of time, uh, t- that time actually builds relationships. Uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, as, as we mentioned earlier, that Jesus himself understood the value of time and investing time with people. Jesus himself appointed 12 so that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. In those three years that Jesus spent with the disciples, living with them, eating with them, sharing with them, doing life on life, and amazing, those 12, 12 men that were sent out changed the world uh, for the glory of God. So likewise, for our children, our children we also need to spend intentional time with them. And for children, love is actually spelt T-I-M-E. So time is actually very important. And we only have our children for a certain number of years. And so we need to actually view uh, that time as a very important time that we need to be intentional to spend with them. So we need to intentionally make time. And the more time you spend together, the closer your relationship will be. The closer the relationship will be, the, 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 the closer the relationship with your children, the greater the influence you will have upon them. So busy parents often do say, you know, I am too busy to spend much time with my kids, but I do think that quality of time is more important. So that's what parents often say. I don't have enough time, but when I do spend time, it's quality time. But children don't often buy into that idea because they can see that what we make time for is important to us, and children equate love with time. So we need to actually view time as an investment. Time spent with your children is an investment with internal dividends. And all of us have 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We will never have enough time to do all the things that we'd like to do, but we do need to make time for our children to be available. But it's not about neglecting your work or it's not about neglecting serving in ministry to go spend time with your kids. It's it's not about advocating irresponsibility. It's about having that wise balance. How do we steward our time so that the time we do spend with them, that we are intentionally sowing and discipling? There are three distinct ways you can spend time with your child. I want want you to take this down. One, there are sensitive moments in a person's life. Sensitive, where they are crying over something. They made a mistake. They they stumbled into sin. Or there is something that is... uh, bothering them and those are sensitive moments and in those sensitive moments we need to be available to be able to bring that teaching it's a teachable moment it is to be able to journey with them and be present for them and that happens even in marriages there are sensitive moments when your wife just makes a a remark you got to ask where is it coming from you got to take time to be able to sit down and to explore that now without doing that we just brush things off. What will happen is emotionally we become detached. Sensitive moments. Secondly, it is not only a sensitive moment, it's a social moment where we need to create memories to be able to journey together and, uh, and intentionally spend time. Now, one of the things that my wife says is that I talk a lot. And I do talk a lot. But it's not just teaching and lecturing all the time but it's about helping them to see about life and asking questions to be able to explore things together, ideas together, and to help them to think uh, about some books that they have have asked them to read, and then come back and ask questions on those things. So it is about interacting and creating that kind of a social moment together. Thirdly, it is just a spiritual moment where we have a regular time as a family where we build the family altar. It has to be a consistent time it doesn't have to be a long time, but it's a, it's a consistent time where we come together, partake of the Lord's table, break bread, open up the scriptures, pray for one another, and allow the Holy Spirit to minister and bring healing to us. Now, these are important things that we do to spend time. Now, one of the things I did as a, as a father is, I also did share this with the church leaders, date your children whether you have a daughter or a boy, just take them out. You have to have that one-on-one time with them. The most important thing is, it is that cultivating that relational intimacy to be able to come back to that place to say, I can depend on my dad. I can always turn to my mom. I can always turn to my dad. I can always have that openness to be able to talk about things. And that's where we need to spend time. And spending time, we have to be intentional. 
and spending time, we need to make sure that it's scheduled in. Uh, for us, we are very busy people. Both of us are very busy. And I know that all of you, if you take down your calendar, there's so many things that you got to be involved in. But one of the things we do is to schedule that regularly. And I don't want you to just think about quantity of time, but I want you to think about the quality of time. That when we do spend, that, that we are fully present, we are fully available, we are fully able to minister, we're fully able to bring that child on a journey where we are able to open up and share. This is important for us. And lastly, intimacy. Intimacy, what is intimacy? Intimacy is, the principle of intimacy is the closer the relationship, greater the influence. The closer you are in your relationship, the greater you can influence that person. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33 says, bad company corrupts good morals. You and I, we need to understand the quality of relationship that we have with our children, with our spouse, will determine the weight of our influence on them. We need to learn to connect at a deeper level. And that's why I'm, I'm sharing this with you that for us to be able to genuinely connect on a deeper level, on an emotional level, we have to be able to peel those wounds and be able to openly share about things. Not take it personal, but allow the Lord to bring layers, peel the onion and go into the core of the issue and be able to talk about this. As a parent, would you be able to say that I know the fears of my children the dreams of my children, or even their ambitions. Because we are here to guide them, we are here to sh share with them. But these are important things. The reason why I'm saying this is because statistics says that a lot of children that are going through depression, that a lot of children that are going through mental illness, the reason is because the world has placed so much pressure. And some of them, it's not just necessarily coming from the peers, it's coming from within the family but no one takes time to truly ask, do you really feel that deep down? Is there a pressure that I, we have placed upon you? I want you to listen to me carefully. Over the years, I've counseled many pastors who have come to me and with broken hearts because their children become wayward because they spend a lot of time in ministry, but they are different at home. Children don't have anyone to talk to. There's a lot of pressure that they go through. Now, these are things that are real. You, don't un you, you and I, we need to open that layer to be able to ask, how can I help? How, what can I do to change? How can we really journey together in this? I want to help you understand there are four levels of intimacy. One, there is a biological intimacy. In other words, because you're born in this household, I'm your father, your, she's your mother, there is an intimacy as a result of that. But that's just a superficial level of intimacy. We, as they grow older, they can grow further away from us if we don't intentionally develop intimacy with them. The second level of intimacy is an emotional intimacy. Emotionally that we are available for them. Emotionally that we are able to bring and build a, an, an environment where they are able to openly share about the deep things that they're struggling with. And that is important. That at an emotional level. Now, I'm talking to Asians predominantly. And we're not good at emotions. Is that right? We don't show emotions. We don't want to show emotions because we equate showing emotions as being weak. But the reality is our children need for us to be emotional, to be able to take in what they are saying, to, to know that it, we, it, we feel it. We are with them on that. It hurts us to see them hurt. And sometimes if we are the ones who cause that hurt, that we are able to take that journey to be able to he bring healing into that wounded spirit. Thirdly, there is an experiential intimacy. Experiential intimacy is when you journey together, do something together, where you go on a holiday together, a hiking together, or a bike riding together, go on a picnic together, do something together, and that brings a bond together. Finally, there is a spiritual intimacy. Now, this spiritual intimacy is very important. If you're a husband, if you're a father, listen to me carefully. You and I have been given the greatest privilege of being a priest at home. You don't have to be a pastor to do that. 
you and I have the privilege of being a priest at home. What it means is that you stand on behalf of God and speak life over your family. And the more you do that, the more you're able to lay hands and proclaim the blessing of the Lord, the more you're able to proclaim through your mouth, you're blessing them. Something happens in the spiritual realm. Something happens to them in their own psyche that there is, there is a spiritual intimacy that happens, a bond. We got to remember that we are a spiritual being first before we are a physical being. We are a spiritual being that live in a physical body. That means we, we, we intuitively, we are craving for spiritual things, spiritual input. And that is where we as parents have the greatest privilege Maybe you're a single parent or you're a mom who's at home with a, with a pre-believing husband. You take authority because the Bible says a woman who is a believer makes things holy at home because of the fact that you believe in Christ. The reality is this, that you can take charge and still pray and create that atmosphere. Pray a blessing upon your husband. Pray a blessing upon your children. Pray a blessing upon their day, upon their future. Speak life and speak the word of God because this is important for us. But I want to end by saying something that is very important and close to my heart. If you're a parent, please listen to me. And if you're married, please listen to me. Relationships take a lot of effort to build. It takes years to build trust in a marriage. It takes years to build trust in your teenage kids from young. But all it takes is just one moment where you can destroy everything. You and I, we need to recognize that. Relationships are fragile. That's why one of the core things that both Pastor Isa and I do is to handle the relationships with care. Whether it's a relationship that we have with our parents or with our mentors or whether with our team that we lead, that we work together and serve together, we have one family, or whether we are with our leaders or whether at home with our children, we take every relationship seriously before God and we do it. The reason I'm saying this is because We need to be aware of that, the f that it's fragile, that it can be broken, that it can be slipped away. That means there is no room for us to just be careless. We can't be careless with our words. We can't be reckless in our words. We can't overpromise and underdeliver. We can't play favoritism at home. We can't just gossip about other people at home. We can't just say something and not keep the word. Those things are important. And don't lose your temper. And don't speak negative words because those words cannot be taken back. And one thing that I'm very aware of is never to disrespect my wife in front of my children. Not to disrespect her. In, I won't do that anywhere, anywhere. But more so, I'm aware that in front of my children, I want to uphold my wife and I give weight to her words. I speak life over her and I pray for her. The same thing she does. The reason is because we have to create that environment of respect and honor. That's the way the kingdom of God works. But I want to also end by saying this. There are times we, we fail because we are vulnerable people. And when we do fail, our words hurt people. And I've taken, over the years, I've taken this step. Doesn't matter who's right, who's wrong. We will always take the step to apologize, to humble ourselves, to reconcile. We take the first step of reconciliation. Because I want you to catch this church. There are children that are growing up with a wounded spirit. There are marriages where the spouse is still carrying a wounded spirit. And it's very easy to detect if you have been journeying with the Lord, it's very easy to detect by just looking at them, just talking to them, just chatting with them. You can feel the hurt, the pain, the darkness that they're trying to cover up. We are called to live in freedom. We are called to live in a place where there should be joy and peace and laughter at home. But in our relationships, if our child is walking away from us and not wanting to talk to us, 
they are isolating increasingly they are depending on other people to talk to them rather than talk from to receive instruction or inspiration from the parents the deep down issue is that there is a wounded spirit now unless and until that wounded spirit is healed and you deal with the root issue and come and bring back that it can manifest itself in a lot of ways so i want you to take to heart that when we come when it comes to relationships one of the core things we we have to understand is that we got to be handling every relationship with care in closing let me give you three simple questions to ask one how can i improve is a brilliant question to ask your spouse it's a brilliant question to ask even your child during family time just sit down and ask is there something that you would specifically say that i need to improve on see i want you to catch this principle we got nothing to prove everything to improve we got nothing to prove but we can improve on everything ask that question when i take her out on a date one of the core questions that will always come up is how can i improve otherwise what will happen is you will talk about the same things the scenery the the cheese the 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 butter the the salt the the bread you talk about the same thing when you go out you got to ask fundamental questions be intentional number 2 how have i hurt you how have i hurt you i think many people would not be ready to ask that question because they know deep down oh my goodness it be like take a week off i have a whole list of things i want to tell you <laughs> but the reality is if you don't start now you just keep piling up stuff sweeping everything under the carpet i want you to listen to me come back to that place where we ask that fundamental question how have i hurt you how can i improve thirdly one of the most important questions a parent or a spouse will ever say and ask is will you please forgive me and when we do that i believe god will bring that healing and bring a step towards reconciliation now there are a lot of things to say but today i want to end here i want us to take some time to just process what we just heard now this is the first time we have done this and i realized that it's a different format to what we normally do but i want you to pay attention to the principles that have been shared but i want you to take to heart this discipleship begins at home we want to be a disciple making church and that discipleship begins at home and that discipleship begins with healthy marriages and healthy families where our children are growing in an environment of health now this is important for us so throughout this year at various times we will talk about this issue and i might take one thing at a time and deal with it but we want you to go on this journey together with us this week would you take a moment maybe start with your spouse relationship maybe take that moment to ask that one question am i modeling a christ likeness it at home for my husband am i modeling a christ likeness before my family do i can i boldly say follow me and you will be following christ secondly do we encourage that open authentic communication at home or are we just superficially talking about things do we deeply go into that place where we can actually ask is there anything that we need to deal with and do we allow the environment where the children or our spouse can openly share before us just clamming up or reacting to it thirdly i want you to think about do you spend that time because time matters do you create intentionally those sensitive moments and social moments and spiritual moments in your relationships and lastly do you really have intimacy if i sit down with your child and ask this million dollar question do you love your father do you really love your mother what will be the answer they may say yes i do but if i ask the question do you really have intimacy with your family with your family 
do you really open up can i humbly say this let me give a insight to all the parents many children will say this to a counselor or to a pastor or to a leader but they will never say this to your face i don't think my parents will accept me if they truly know who i am they know a version of me but they don't know me because if they truly know me i'm not sure if they will love me and that is deep down the fear of every child and that may be if sometimes it's projected because that's the fear even in your marriage if my husband truly knows what i'm thinking if my wife really knows what i'm doing if my wife really knows who i am on the inside will she really accept me would she really love me these are things we need to deal with church but bottom line is it comes back from a place of hurt wounds that have not been cleared things that have not been dealt with so i want you to take this moment think through this week some of the things that are surfacing in your life think have a think time think through things and say lord these are areas i need help these are areas where i need help in my marriage in my parenting and start to work on a plan on that would you do that every head bow every eye close all across this place heavenly father we thank you i pray in the name of jesus that you give us grace mighty god to bring authenticity in our lives especially in our home life i pray in our marriage that you bring healing restoration and you will help us to walk authentically in our parenting you will give us grace mighty god to truly be authentic with our children and to create an environment where they can be loved fully known and fully loved where they can have an empowering environment where they can rise up and be children of god who live in freedom where there is true intimacy between husband and wife and parents and children i pray father for your grace to come upon your people i pray for marriages that are going through a season of pain or a season where they are dealing with issues i pray that you bring reconciliation and i pray that you help them father in this season as a church we come to you thank you for opening our doors thank you for giving us a place to come and worship this morning this afternoon and we thank you for this open door we pray your blessing upon this open door and we pray that every time as we gather here that you we will have an encounter with you that we will have an audience with the king that you will do a deep work of transformation in our lives in our marriages in every aspect of our life that we will continue to be transformed from glory to glory and lord that you will raise a, a church that is strong in the word strong in the spirit and continue to build strong godly marriages we thank you in jesus name we pray and the people of god said amen and amen would you stand it to your feet please come is there a chorus we're singing just sing that one what a wonderful name it is let's sing it together church what a wonderful name it is the name of jesus christ my king what a wonderful name it is and nothing can Lift up the name of Jesus. Come on.
receive this benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you shalom. Go in his peace, church, in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, amen and amen. We love you. God bless you. Next Sunday is an online service only. But the following week, we're back again here. And this time, it will be a testimony Sunday. So bring your friends and family who want to rejoice in the faithfulness of God. It will be a blessed Sunday to bring our non-Christian friends to hear the reality of God's favor and grace. God bless you. Have a blessed week. We love you.